The Nintendo Entertainment System had many peripherals during its commercial lifespan, but there was never much of a practical pointing device like a mouse or light pen. Most point-and-click games on the NES always felt awkward to control with a normal D-pad, and as I started developing homebrew for the system, I discovered a few homebrew games that used the Super NES mouse as an optional control scheme, where you just point-and-click like you would on a computer. So how is this possible considering that the Super NES mouse came an entire console generation later? You can't exactly plug a Super NES controller into an NES port, or can you? The NES and Super NES share nearly identical methods of reading their standard controllers. Each port has seven pins that share the same functionality. Two of these pins are special purpose and won't really be discussed in this video. Well, the other five pins are connected to a shift register inside each controller, and each bit of the shift register represents the state of each button, whether it's pressed or depressed. Three of these pins are used in a pseudo-SPI configuration. We'll call these pins clock, latch, and data. Every frame, the game would send a pulse on the latch line to capture the current state of the buttons in the shift register. Then, it would transfer each bit serially over the data line each time the clock line is pulsed. In other words, the controller sends its input report one bit at a time whenever the corresponding controller I.O. register is read. This design makes it easy to support controllers with more buttons, just use a larger shift register and read in more bits. A standard Super NES controller is just an NES controller with a larger shift register. Its input report is just an extension of the NES controller's input report, so theoretically, if you just connect the wires to the right pins of the controller port, you could use Super NES controllers on the NES no problem. You can get Super NES to NES controller adapters like this one from Rafnet, and you can use Super NES controllers with pretty much every NES game out there. Some homebrew games even take advantage of the extra buttons on the controller for more actions. You could also technically connect NES controllers to the Super NES in this manner, but seeing as most all Super NES games will expect at least 16 bits of data from the controller, you probably won't be able to play most Super NES games properly. So it's possible to connect standard Super NES controllers to the NES, but what about the mouse? The Super NES mouse is read in the exact same way as standard controllers, except that it contains a larger 32-bit chip register. From its input report, we can get the button states, mouse sensitivity, and vertical and horizontal displacements in sign magnitude format, and we can change the mouse's sensitivity by sending clock pulses while the latch line is still high. Of course, none of the official NES games back then would have been written to support such a device like this, but modern ROM hacks and homebrew are open to support these kinds of peripherals. Emulators like Messin, NFC, UX, and Poonest even have dedicated mouse support built in. Now, there were some pointing devices made during the NAS's lifespan, but they were either Japan-exclusive, unreliable, or just weren't designed to work as a full-tracking cursor. The Super NES mouse is a quite common peripheral, and there's even modern clones like the HyperClick Retro-style mouse by Hyperkin. It uses an optical sensor and has a dedicated button to cycle mouse sensitivity, as opposed to the original mouse's software sensitivity cycling. Its main buttons are also much clickier than the rubber membrane buttons of the original. The availability and lower cost of these mice make them fairly suitable for homebrew support. I'm currently developing a paint program for the NES that fully supports the mouse, which I'll link down in the description. Having real analog control really makes a huge difference when compared to a D-pad. It just gives you that finer sense of control that a digital interface simply can't match. And especially compared to other art programs that came out on the NES, which were only designed with the D-pad in mind, the mouse just makes the concept work. There's also a growing handful of other NES homebrew games that include mouse support. Thwake, developed by Damian Yerrick, is a Missile Command clone that was the very first NES game to utilize the Super NES mouse. It really is the ideal way to play games like this. You have two missile silos with their own separate ammo counters, and you can shoot from either of them with the left or right mouse buttons. You shoot the onslaught of missiles falling from the sky to protect your town for as long as possible. The incredibly chill music paired with this constant looming threat certainly creates an interesting vibe. Mm -hmm. 
Desert Golfing, developed by Brad Smith, is a demake of the mobile game Desert Golfing that uses the mouse to control your ball's trajectory and power. It's a rare display of realistic physics on the NES that not many games on the platform attempted to achieve. I highly recommend watching his own making of video on the game, which I've linked in the description. Not only does it support the mouse, but it also supports 4-player adapters like the 4-score in NES Satellite. Unfortunately, that does not mean you can plug in 4 mice at once. A Super NES mouse draws much more current than a standard controller, and plugging in more than 2 mice could potentially overheat the system's voltage regulator. So I would certainly avoid designing a game around using more than 2 mice. Each playthrough of Nezzer Golfing has 256 procedurally generated holes with different terrain and weather. There's also an enhanced graphic version for the Super NES, sort of bringing things around full circle regarding the Super NES mouse. Sadly doesn't have enhanced audio though. Sliding Blaster by Nova Squirrel is loosely based off the Big City Slider Station infomercials with Billy Mays. That's not a joke. You use the mouse to freely aim and shoot enemies while also being able to boost in the direction you're facing. Aiming and moving are mostly detached from each other, so you mostly end up sliding around, bouncing off a of terrain, picking up ammo and health while trying to avoid crashing into enemies and bombs. The lack of direct movement control usually leads to absolute chaos. Nescape by Kevin Hanley is probably the most ambitious NES homebrew to use the Super NES mouse so far. Being a fleshed out point and click escape room with tons of puzzles, a mouse just seems like the perfect fit. You have one hour to find your way out of this dimly lit room where almost every object is a puzzle that needs solving. Even the title screen itself is its own puzzle. The mouse behaves exactly how you'd expect a point and click to work, except in this one unique instance where you have to tilt this ball maze by slowly moving the mouse while holding either the left or right button to tilt on the vertical or horizontal axis. It's really neat, and overall, Nescape really evokes the experience of classic 90s PC adventure games like Myst and The Seventh Guest. Steel Moons, developed by Mazionak, is a free-roaming space shooter with asteroids controls, and while I'm not a big fan of asteroids, I gotta say that the mouse makes this game control much easier than with the D-pad. You move your cursor to point your ship in a direction, fire your weapon, and thrust in the direction you're facing. I still find it easy to overshoot your target and struggle trying to manage your velocity, especially when dodging enemy fire, but the mouse certainly feels more natural for this kind of game. The music is also really catchy. I also found a couple improvement hacks for the NES versions of Shadowgate and Maniac Mansion that have mouse support. It's a bit surreal to see such iconic NES point and clicks finally given full analog control. Even if they are just ports of existing games which are somewhat already designed around mouse control, but regardless. I've linked all these games in the description below if you'd like to try them out for yourself. Having access to a mouse peripheral really opens up new gameplay styles that either didn't translate well to a standard controller, or just didn't exist at all during the NES's commercial lifespan. I also find the idea of using peripherals on systems older than when they were originally introduced just a fascinating concept, and one you don't really see too often on home consoles. I'm really looking forward to what future NES games can do with this peripheral. Thanks for listening, and let me know if you want to see future videos like this.